thank you guys for coming. Um, we have a really exciting workshop with uh, microgreens. So thank you for being in person and everyone online. Um, I will hand it over to our friends here, Rebecca and Carvel. They'll be hosting our workshop, but I'm with TCEDC and this is, we're working under a grant to provide some fun workshops on how to grow some items. And this is one of our new favorite items, microgreens. So I will hand it over to Carvel and Rebecca. Thank cool. you. Thanks everybody uh, who's out there tuning in. Uh, basically what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about what microgreens are, uh, the difference between microgreens and sprouts, and you know the health, some of the health benefits, why you should eat them, why they're very environmentally friendly, and uh, just go over a little bit of kind of simply how, how we grow them and, and what we do. So in front of me we brought a couple of live trays. These are actually in day five of their grow. They have another five days before they will be harvested. And we have an empty tray here to kind of show you how, how we plant them. So, you know, first question, obviously, what, what is microgreens? What are they? Um, essentially, they are the plant in its cotyledon phase. So they, sometimes people get confused with microgreens and sprouts, and basically the difference is the way that they're grown and harvested. So our microgreens are grown seed to harvest in 10 days, and sprouts are typically four days. These also grow up from the medium and are cut above the medium and harvested. Um, so that's the, that's the big difference. Um, and the health benefits, why you should eat them, they're anywhere from 10 to 40x nutrient dense of their mature counterparts. So for instance, this is our small retail package that's $5, this has amaranth in it, but the, this filled with broccoli has the equivalent sulforaphane of a pound and a half of raw broccoli. So the fact that we can grow that with a relatively small amount of water in a short amount of time and get that much nutritional value out of it, um, you know, it's just, it's huge. So, And on um, our website, we have a link to a study by the USDA uh, that explains some of the scientific work that they did in the lab to analyze um, microgreens in their cotyledon stage, which is, you know, basically a dicot, the two leaves here. Mm -hmm. um, this is the cotyledon stage. And this is when it is its absolute most powerful um, at this stage because it's requiring all of this energy uh, to grow up and make the adult version of the plant, right? So if you go to our website, it's uh, www.midoriacres.com. You can find a couple of links that speak to the health benefits of microgreens and um, the USDA study that is on, that they conducted on. So pretty amazing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're continuing to do more and more research ourselves and find out all the different varieties and their, their main nutritional uh, punch points, so to speak. Um, you know, broccoli high in sulforaphane, uh, antioxidants. We have learning more about our sunflower shoots, which a quarter cup of them has six grams of protein. It also has poly and monosaturated fats that fight bad cholesterol. So the list goes on and on. Again, we're learning more about that. Um, the cabbage, huge on gut health. And let's talk about how we plant them. So basically we plant all of our microgreens in these 10, 20 flats. This one has no holes in it, and this one does. So simply said, we stack them together, we cover this in soil, we tamp it down, and we just sprinkle the seeds across the top. At that point, we water and mist them, and then we actually stack them on top of each other for three to four days in germination, and then six to seven days under the light. So these did four days, um, both of these varieties. These are our pea shoots, and this is our salad blend. Um, they did four days stacked up in germination, and today's actually day one under the light, and they're being little troopers because they're not under the light. So they have to trip over here to talk to you guys, and then we'll get them back into their spot. Um, and then another five days, they'll be ready to harvest. Um, we use organic MP uh, soil that we then repurpose into a compost pile and, and do into our outdoor garden. So. And you say under the light, what, what light do you use? We use LED grow lights. Um, a lot of people use fluorescent, significantly less expensive. We made the choice to 
moved to LEDs because we run our entire farm off of a, a giant solar array. Um, that enabled us to continue scaling and also stay under that umbrella of what we actually produce so that we can grow all of our microgreens with 100% solar power. Mm -hmm. um, and the seeds, where do we source the seeds? The seeds we source uh, from Canada, actually. There are some US-based companies, and we don't like to go so far, but um, price-wise, we, we order giant pallets of seeds. So we get in there. Their company is also 100% organic. So USDA certified mm -hmm. organic. Some of the other companies you have to, to, to move through different seeds um, to pick organic, and these ones are all all organic the entire company. So yeah. we bottom water everything. That's why these have holes in them. You can see um, the roots pop up oh, wow. out under there. We sure. water it on the bottom, and the roots go get the water and pull it up. Yeah. Um, we're able to, in that short cycle, 10 day grow cycle, overlap our germination and growing so that we can actually harvest uh, fresh produce every single week. So every single week, we're harvesting and delivering inside of our mission, which is 24 hours. Um, and some are, are even shorter. We cut and deliver within a couple of hours. So. Can you speak to when they're in germination, um, the peas, for example? Uh, the weight that's required for the yeah so we have we have our we have three varieties it's pretty impressive that they do this sunflower shoots pea shoots and our radish that all require 15 pound pavers on top so we stack anywhere from four to seven trays in germination all on top of each other then we put a 15 pound paver on top of that basically simulates the weight um, of soil on top of them for them to shoot their roots down and, and, and plant up. And at that point, I mean, in three to four days, I have to keep a close eye on it because it will push that paver. And we've had it multiple times just completely dump it over. So this will, you know, be a couple feet high when it's stacked with that paver and it'll push it and start to slide wow. all the trays over um, really those, awesome. those varieties. There's lots of different, you know, kind of opinions and ways that people do it. We've studied a diff some different ways. Some people weight all of them. Um, we find the brassicas don't need that weight. So the brassicas are all of our smaller, seeded um, microgreens, your broccolis, cabbage, um, purple kohlrabi we grow, yeah. uh, bok choy, arugula, mustards, um, yeah. And what about the trays? Do you get the where do you get the trays as well? The trays are from a relatively small company, uh, Bootstrap Farmer, here in the United States, and they produce all of them. And they're a little more expensive, but they're significantly more durable. Um, you have a lot of ten twenty flats that are right on the edge of disposable, and as as rough as we're putting them through week in week out. Um, you know, a lot of farms that that do high volume trays use those cheaper ones, and they end up breaking them. And of course, then they have to be thrown away. And so we opted to get some, you know, higher quality ones, and we can still manage to break these ones too, but they much less. So they're pretty, pretty stout trays. And then in terms of watering, how often are you watering? We are trying to only water once a day, but I keep a close eye on that. That's probably one of the largest nuances to growing microgreens and the biggest thing. Uh, to learn and in my opinion really the only way to learn that is by doing it and making your mistakes so you're gonna figure out what that is but it's basically the trays are lifted up and then the water goes underneath and they, they suck it up from there but it's a relatively small amount of soil that they're sitting in and the roots are in there so what can happen relatively quickly is if they're over watered um, the soil will completely saturate then you'll have the roots underneath just sitting in water um, and that's what we call dampen off as soon as that happens those roots will die and the plants are done um, and on the flip side of that very quickly once they dry out only in an inch of soil they can flop right down so as easy as everything is that's the nuance um, and, the, and the biggest thing in my opinion is, is learning that watering um, and getting that dialed in and the only way to do that is trial and error you know, everybody that's worked with me that I've trained, first of all, I went through it, I screwed it up enough times that I figured it out, 
I teach them everything I know. I try to show them the weights. And again, the only way you can do that is, is just by doing it. They still go over and they make the same mistakes. But I have done it for so long enough now that as I go to water them, I actually lift. I'm lifting the tray up anyways, and immediately I can identify how heavy it is. Mm. So I'll, I know exactly how much water it needs. So you're trying to uniformly water everything. We're doing 200 to 250 trays a week. So, you know, some of that watering fluctuates. And, and you have to catch it the next day. So something that's a little bit lighter that you didn't water as much, now it needs a little more. And then on the flip side, that's where you're watering. Uh, mistakes compound is day after day. So if it's a little bit heavy and you water it the same amount, it's gonna be oversaturated in, in that stack up of days. So if you fluctuate it a little bit, but you know what that is, you can catch it. And, and that's how you mitigate that. Could you grow micro greens in your home? Sure, absolutely. Um, that's where I started. I actually grew them in the windowsill. Um, it's going to take quite a bit longer. Our, our, again, seed to harvest in 10 days is based on kind of optimal growing um, conditions as far as um, humidity and heat. But the best thing about microgreens in your home, I mean, microgreens simply said, as I say it, are humans. So what do humans like? That's what microgreens like. You know, rough anywhere from 30 to no more than hopefully 50 or 60 percent humidity and 68 to 72 degrees which is where we keep most of our homes so you can do that you can get a little supplemental light uh, that's really going to help or if the temperature is good and you have a big enough windowsill you can get smaller trays might take two weeks two and a half weeks but they will grow and here in Taos, it can get really dry. So are you using a humidifier to help out or no? No, we're the opposite. And we're, okay. that's one of our biggest uh, things that we're trying to dial in right now. We have a giant commercial dehumidifier that's ah. still struggling to keep up. When you get 200 trays all being watered in a relatively small space, um, they create a lot of humidity. They also create a lot of heat as well. So, you know, we're in our shoulder seasons, we have, you know, a mini split in our farm and you would be assuming, you know, when it's 40 degrees outside that, that you would have the heater running to keep that building up and it's the opposite. We have the AC running because they're producing so much heat. So we don't really start kicking in the heater until the winter. And even at that point, it doesn't have to kick very hard when they're in their growth cycles because they're producing a fair amount of heat themselves. Hmm. Um, so yeah, you know, as far as you know, building out a farm and, and stuff, it's really becomes down to your, your airflow, your humidity, and your temperature. And all of those are gonna vary based on the size of your farm and how many trays you're growing. So um, once you kind of figure that out and get that in there, and then the main thing is consistency. So you know, for us, we've been running higher humidity than we'd like. However, we know what that humidity is, and so we're able to ha have the airflow and running that constantly. We, we know what to expect. If you start fluctuating temperatures, airflow, and humidity, then that's where you're going to run into some issues. Or really, if you have a problem with your grow, you won't know what it is because you're fluctuating those conditions. So would you say that's your biggest challenge is the humidity factor in the growing process or what would you say? For us at this point, yes. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, again, we've got it pretty, we're running it at about 60%. Um, and it's, it's there in the winter. In the summer, it's not as much of an issue, but that colder condensed air is, it um, runs at a higher humidity in the summer. It's, and then Taos, like you said, it's dry. So when you know the outside is closer um, to the temperature that we want, we can open the door and just like that, that humidity is gone. So we're, we're figuring that out. I mean, I know it's as simple as another um, commercial dehumidifier for us to really get it where we want, which we're pr probably pretty close to needing to pull the trigger on that. Um, as we progress up, that's the other thing is the trays move up, it's just all, changes a little bit and we've been scaling at such a fast pace we're at a year and a half now and fortunately for us and we're happy to get it out there to the community but the demand has been very high so very seldom through my experience scaling have we had very similar um, 
conditions. You know, over the last maybe six months, we've, we've plateaued a little bit and we've actually tried to do that so that we can dial everything in. But when you're going from 20 to 40 to 60 to 80 to 100 to 120 trays in a short period of time where the, where the build out is and everything, those, those conditions are gonna change. And our farm right now has a capacity for 256 trays. We could bump that up a little bit but we're only growing, you know, roughly 200. And if we go from 200 to 250, the humidity, everything's going to change, even in the footprint that we're at right now. So. And what's your recommendation in terms of number of trays you start with as you're learning? Um, for just for a personal grow, or for or, or if you're trying to actually start a farm. Uh, I guess for both. Which... Yeah, I mean, simply said. They, it's all it's all out there on YouTube. The rack builds are, are relatively inexpensive and, and not super hard to do. And so we're growing vertical farms and you can start with run rack, one rack. That's where you start. So it's their wire shelving units and you can space them out to have four or five roughly. If you want to get I've seen some condensed farms have six um, shelves and they fit four. They're 24 by 48. So they fit four of these trays perfectly on one shelf. So you're going to be growing anywhere from 16 to maybe 24 trays. Ours are all four and five. Um, the, the shoots uh, get a little taller, so we space them out, those, tra those um, racks out just a little bit more. So we grow in 16 on those and, um, and 20 on the other ones. So that's, that's definitely where the start is. That's where we started. You build one rack and you go from there. And you, you build the next one and the next one and you just keep going. That's the nice thing about microgreen farming. We did it a little bit faster, but a lot of farms, um, it's, it's very scalable in how you do it. So you can start it smaller, you can produce some revenue, and then you can start to add on as you go from there. We kind of didn't do it that way just because we scaled so quickly that we just hit the gas hard and started getting a lot of racks quickly and infrastructure and everything built out. So. For a beginner grower, what uh, variety would you recommend to try um, that might be the easiest? I mean, the only ones that are can be very, you know, there's only a couple that are really challenging. So you're going to really start with the ones that are the most popular, the most, especially in a commercial setting, but then they're also some of the highest uh, nutrient um, densities and most popular out there and that's sunflower radish maybe some kind of salad blend which is what we have here and what's the one that I'm forgetting peas, peas sunflower radish and a salad mix so is there a difference between the shoots and the brassicas as far as when you plant it you have to like soak seeds for the brassicas or we soak peas and sunflower and that's it. So we soak our peas for 12 hours. We soak the sunflowers uh, for two to three hours before they're planted and everything else is planted dry. Um, and like I said, we started with those four varieties and most farms do, that's gonna be your highest demand. And again, that's uh, sunflower, pea, radish, and salad. So we have blends and mixes in our farm. A blend ultimately is the seeds are mixed together first and then planted across the tray, which is what this is. So you have five different brassicas in this salad blend and a mix, which we do a spring mix. And that is literally everything that we grow where it's all grown separately, then we mix it in a tub, then we package it and send it out. That's one of our most popular um, varieties now is actually our spring mix. It comes in a slightly bigger container. And if you're trying to decide which one to grab, you can grab one container that has everything. A lot of people are doing that. So. These are the two shoots. These are pea shoots, and these are the sunflower shoots. And so these are the two that you soak the seeds. Um, you soak the pea seeds the night before, and then the sunflowers four hours before you plant? Uh, two to three. Okay. And then you can sort of see if you tip the tray up on the peas a little bit. It's pretty easy. Once they're soaked and you put the soil down, you just oh. could spread the peas out with your hands. And then it's ready to go, so it's pretty easy. I have a couple of questions from our Instagram Live. One is about insurance. What type of insurance do you need? And the other one is, how do you clean the holes of sunflower shoots? 
Probably, I mean, let's start with the second question because that is the most popular question, um, period. And it took me a while to, to figure that out. And I consulted with a, a very large scale uh, professional grower out of Canada. Um, and our model was pretty much based after his. And basically what we do, the sunflower holes are a battle. They're the most labor intensive and they're the most popular um, variety that there is. But what we do, um, and, and we're doing it on a large scale, so it's dip, It's just a little easier on some farms that, you know, if you're growing 40 trays in a week and only six of those are sunflower, it's not as big of a deal. We grow anywhere, again, being our most popular, 40 to 48 trays of sunflower. So getting the holes off of all those trays, the way that we do it is we germinate them uh, for three days and then we have humidity domes that we put on top of them. So we then top water them um, to get those seed holes wet and then we put a humidity dome on top of them. Then as they grow, it softens the, the seed uh, being in that humidity, they start to fall off and then we brush them across the top with our hands every single day for four days and then they're pretty much all falling off at that point, at which point we take the domes off they completely dry out and kind of finish their grow. And then we still do put um, a fine final touch on there. And that's just something that I started doing and I can't really go back on now. And that's, you know, because we, we like to have them served and you, you might be able to find one or two holes, but most would do the way that we did it. And you're gonna find some holes in your commercial package and we work really hard to not do that. So we have most of them fallen off um, and by doing that over, over three to four days with the humidity domes, and then we find comb them, and it takes significantly less. When we first started, we spent hours, hours <laughs> doing it, <laughs> getting them off, and trying different techniques. Some do similar to that, they brush them, and then they cut them um, into you know, massive containers or whatever, and then sort them, try to sort them from there. There's different ways to harvest. We like to handle it as little as possible and preserve the um, cell structure of the microgreens. So we cut everything directly into the container. So these were all harvested into the container. The tray was here, it's cut, it's put in the container, wow. the lid goes on and it goes in the fridge. So we get a really long shelf life off of that. So that's how, that's how we do the, the sunflower. If you don't put the humidity dome on top, it can dry on the leaf. And so if you try to pull that hole off, it can tear yeah, the they, leaf. they clamp down. So that's why we use the humidity domes. And we found that it's kind of <clears throat> our labor in half, maybe, yeah. by yeah, doing that. At least more the if not more. It's, yeah, we've dialed that more and more. Insurance, to answer the insurance question, ultimately that, I mean, we, we carry very high insurance just because. Just um, but... Mm -hmm. It's basically dependent on where you're gonna sell them. So mm -hmm. local, little local stores and stuff, they might not require, I mean, you should carry some no matter what, regardless of what anybody requires, but some, like, you know, farmers, like, nobody's gonna ask for if you have insurance. You wanna go to Whole Foods or some bigger places like that, you're gonna need a, at least a million in liability. We carry two and you could go up from there. Five, yeah. Um, two, two to five million in, in product liability insurance. But and it's easy to get. You can find companies that support ag businesses and they will have very reasonable policies that you can pay anywhere from $100 to $200 a year and it'll cover you for that dollar amount. Yeah. But it is important to have. And it's, these are, these are you know, considered low risk. So you have, the, again, the difference right. in sprouts and microgreens. Sprouts are significantly higher risk because they're grown in their medium. Their medium is water, but they're grown in that medium. And then you have the, the seed hole, the root, um, and your sprout, which is they do that in four days. And then they're grown high heat, high humidity. Unfortunately, bacteria likes high heat, high humidity. So dealing with that, it's a much uh, higher risk product. Ours growing um, up out of the medium dry and being cut above that medium and put into the, the container, it's just a whole nother find out. I can't thing that's kind of why they're, they're taking off. And, and, and how is the cutting, how is the cutting done? What is used to cut it? So we just use a relatively inexpensive, uh, very sharp knife. Uh -huh. um, it's blunt edge. Some people do, you know, scissors I've heard of. I've never really understood that, but it's, again, it's slightly nuanced and it's cut 
Um, you know, we basically, I grab the microgreens and, and with that sharp knife, I'm able to just cut them and put them directly into the package. Um, get a little bit of nuances in there because you've got to make sure that you cut um, everything that you're holding. Because if you don't, and I check it to make sure anyways, but if you're holding something that you don't quite cut, and as you pull it out, you're going to pull, pull out soil, dirt, and all of that stuff. And that's what you don't want in your container. So I checked that, and obviously it's something that you can get used to. Super high um, production farms have automatic cutters. Um, well, I've seen him do it, and he's like a microgene, microgreens Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful when you're cutting the smaller ones. We, we grew, you know, the other thing is we, we grew for months uh, personally and, final, and fine tuning everything before I put anything into actual commercial. So, you know, I started it for myself, and for me, it's been the single greatest dietary move I've ever done in my life. And if you're like me, and most of us, you know, we've tried everything, this, this diet, that, all the different things, and, you know, the way that our bodies responded to them, and the more that we learned about it, that's kind of where the whole thing spawned from. And so, I was growing them in the window seal and kind of trying to figure it out. And then I was able to touch base with SIDS um, and, and they were very interested. And that's when I started learning um, the real commercial side of it from growing, growing properly, growing safely, sustainably, the containers, the pricing. Our pricing is very aggressive for both restaurants and um, consumers in the, in the world of microgreens. We're really trying to get it so you can incorporate it into your diet and so you know that's that's how we started and we probably grew for three or four months five months um just trying different things learning all of those uh different techniques to, to do that we planted our first commercial grow that we were going to put into put out into the world and we planted 24 trays and it took us eight hours now we plant 200 trays in four hours wow so, yeah and then our packaging too, we didn't want to put any single-use plastic into the environment. And so we decided to get our packaging from a company called uh, World Centric. And it's 100% made from plants hmm. and it's compostable. Wow. So, I mean, you're still, you know, putting something into the environment, but at least it can be composted. At least it, we know it won't be here forever. Right, yeah. it will biodegrade over time. So we time. really like their packaging and their company and their mission and, and something that I found out well after the fact of using it, which actually blew my mind, was they donate 25% of their profits to grassroots nonprofit environmental organizations. So you hear a lot of companies, one, one, two, three, five percent, one quarter of everything that they make, they donate. So that, in my opinion, is a company I want to support. Yeah. Do just to go back to insurance really quickly, yeah. um, in terms of like when you're new, starting something new, insurance often has questions like, is this your first time? Or did you have that kind of uh, sort of pushback from the insurance company when you went? No, it was just a matter of finding the insurance company that knew what we were growing and that partners with ag business yeah. Yeah. and then didn't ask questions like that. But you know, in speaking with our local insurance company that covers our buildings, you know, we had to explain to them what we do because they weren't quite sure. But when you're purchasing insurance for growing microgreens, the big ag companies will know exactly what it's for. And I cannot remember the name of the insurance company that we have, but I'll get it for everybody so that you guys can have that. Awesome. You know, the, the health inspector, who was it that you spoke to about? But just the licensing, like as far as... Oh, yeah, so I called the uh, state ag department and then I also spoke with, um, you know, I used to be a food safety inspector and so I was concerned about any regulations around um, producing these and harvesting them and, and getting them out into the world. And um, they told me that sprouts are heavily regulated and so they wanted to make sure that's not what we were growing. And they said that microgreens are not, just uh, because you are cutting. And they basically back those questions in to see if you knew, to make sure that you were growing microgreens yeah. and, and not That's sprouts, right. even though they knew the questions were, you know, all around, like, where's the medium, what do you know? Yeah. Are you growing sprouts or are you growing microgreens? Yes. <laughs> so the food safety concerns are really minimized because you're cutting above the soil line, and the soil is where the bacteria 
bacteria they are mm -hmm. that could cause foodborne illness. But um, and then of course they want you know proper hand wash sinks and three compartment sinks in the barn, which we have. Um, but yeah, very minimal and much less risk required um, and regulation around any other vegetable, um, lettuce, all of the melons, uh, sprouts. They're all heavily regulated because they you can get really sick from those if they come into the field and they're not properly handled and properly washed. But these are completely different stories, so they're very easy, user-friendly. So concerning uh, the trays then at this point, so once a, a set of microgreens is you know cut, ready, done, then what's that next step? What happens with the trays? What? Yeah, we start fresh every single week. So we, go through all of that, we dump all the trays into our compost, and then we scrub and wash all the trays um, every single week, and then once a month we sanitize them just to make sure. But um, yeah, so it's, it's all started fresh um, every single week, um, again, to cut down on that, any potential um, infectious you know, bacteria that could be growing in, in that. So luckily for us, you know, I have a hard time figuring out exactly how you do it in a city or, you know, there's got to be different commercial composting or stuff like that. But this is really pretty high end soil. It's actually quite a bit more high end than it actually needs. It's really about workflow and soil retention. Um, and then the fact that we're able to reuse it, we, we can justify that. But that's, you know, these, the seeds, Again, in their cotyledon phase, they have everything that they need to grow for a week, so they can al also be grown hydroponically. It's just, you know, for us, it's all about workflow. So this is the way that we do it in order to be as efficient as we can, but you can grow them hydroponically um, as well. But like I said, we have a massive um, compost pile with worms and everything, and then we're able to repurpose that into our our outdoor garden for the spring and summer and, and really we see that added value out of that for us and in this this area most people are probably going to have that i mean even adding it to your trees or or whatever i would struggle if i had to just throw it away yeah. it's just gone mm -hmm. we reuse yeah. it yeah that's a good question but i did start i did grow hydroponically and you know if you're growing for yourself that's what i would actually recommend doing you know if you're growing commercially it becomes different but if you're in it, if you're only growing it's, it's, there's so many different levels, you know, growers grow just for the farmer's market, you're growing maybe 20, 40 trays, if that's all you want to do. We're, in, we're doing restaurants, grocery stores, customers, but, you know, that lesser amount of trays, you can, you can grow on biodegradable substrate, you know, that's, you don't have to, to deal with soil inside your house, you don't have to worry about it falling out, getting dirty. It's basically just a biodegradable substrate that goes in, you saturate it, those seeds are planted on top of that, and then they grow. Um, peas, sunflower, and radish, you cannot grow hydroponically. They just, they won't, they don't, they don't germinate as well. So, you know, those are on, and I've actually set some of my friends up across the country um, with little mini grows for themselves. You know, you can find little two foot lights, you can grow four trays. Uh, for yourself, and it's all brassica. So they do salad mixes, broccolis. There's plenty of great, great ones out there. You know, that's where I started to grow any uh, shoots. All I was growing was brassicas, and I was growing them hydroponically. It's just a lot cleaner and easier. Now, when you start to scale, and it's it's too expensive, and it's not as seamless um, to set up. We we plant 52 trays at once, so we plant them all out on similar tables to this, but they're taller, and then we actually go to go across like this, and we plant out over four tables, 52 trays, we scoop all the soil in, we smooth it all out at once, we tamp it all at once, we seed it, stack them up, and do it again, and that's how we <coughs> are able to, to plant so many so quickly. So it really depends on, on what, what it is that you're doing, what you're trying to they can be grown outside too, you know, if, depending on that in different hoop houses or different greenhouses, might take you a little bit longer, depending on the temperatures. We start pushing 80, 85, it's gonna be tough. So, you know, but a simple shade cloth or an afternoon shade where they're getting it in the sun, um, the sun if you didn't, if you wanted to just grow for yourself outside in spring or summer, you could definitely do that. Um, 
And an, an average wise, a tray gets you how many of those size packages? Uh, like four, four, to, four to five yeah. maybe. We get roughly a pound um, of microgreens for our shoots, which is our peas and sunflowers. And then we get close to a half pound out of our brassicas. Radish is a little bigger, we definitely get a half pound um, per tray out of that. And then we're anywhere from 200, 180 to 220 uh, grams, two, two, 225 is a half pound, is what, where we're kind of trying to get to, but yeah. And we, we, we package them, you know, this is a bigger, this is a half pound container that we sell to the restaurants. To the chefs, yeah. Um, and then you have um, our shoots are the only ones that go in these bigger ones. We have some of the brassicas packed up. Because they're longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they need a bigger package. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the brassicas are smaller, so they just take the little, the smaller. The littler ones. Yeah. They're so pretty. Yeah. yeah. And they're really, they're really, 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 really flavorful. So that's where. Question. Um, for home growing, mm -hmm. did you tell me this at the beginning? Yeah, but that's okay. We'll answer. Great. Yeah. Um, as a south-facing covered cabana, mm -hmm. but it would certainly freeze. I would think, as a single person drawing one tray, is what I would want to do. What would you say is most important for me to know? I would recommend uh, doing that indoors. So I would find um, a shelf somewhere, uh, you know, that, that you can that you can utilize in a separate room or somewhere. And then I would purchase grow lights. So Sun Blaster makes really nice grow lights, um, two foot, um, and. One tray, I mean, you're, you could definitely, I mean, definitely be able to grow two. So I'd say give some to your friends, grow, grow two, <laughs> two trays a week. And if you really want to turn it over, that's what we do. So we plant um, uh, three to four days pr prior to, um, we, we overlap it. So we're harvesting on Wednesday and on Monday, Sunday, Monday, we're planting. So then everything, um, and then they're all, they all can be a little different. Rule of thumb is pretty much four days germination, six days lights and harvest. Some farms, you, you, you move that around a little bit. Some varieties can be three days um, in germination. Some, you know, are ready to be harvested at eight, nine days. And some might be a little bit, little bit longer. Those are nuances that you kind of can read about and figure out in your different varieties, but you're very simple. Um, you know, four days germ, um, six days under the light. So you would be planting, uh, you know, let's say on Sunday and then Wednesday you would be harvesting their tray that you were going to take and put into your refrigerator. Um, and then that next, you would have just planted on Sunday, so you'd put that next one right up under the light again if you wanted to turn it over and have fresh microgreens every single week um, so that you never kind of missed a gap. Otherwise, you would be, you know, harvesting, you would have them for a week and then you'd be planting that same day. Yeah, you'd be planting that same day, um, but you'd be waiting 10 days, which depending on your consumption, you know, might be fine too. Where we, we do a shelf life of roughly um, almost two weeks on all of our brassicas and our shoots are closer to three weeks, but that's, um, you know, based on the way that we grow it, harvest it into these plant-based biodegradable containers that protect the cell structure. If they go into a Ziploc bag, it's a different ball game. You're gonna start to crush them, that cell structure a little bit and that shelf life is gonna shrink. Um, but that's, yeah. And the brassicas are probably the ones you'd wanna start off with growing at home because the shoots, the peas and the sunflowers, you have to soak those prior to planting to get them to germinate and then you have to put weight on top of them whereas the brassicas are a little bit more delicate and they don't need to be soaked. So I'll give you this menu. It's got our, our brassicas here on the left side and you could start growing broccoli or a salad blend. Um, so Sun Blaster two foot lights, mm -hmm. Bootstrap Farmer. You can peruse their website. You're gonna be able to find Bootstrap, bootstrap mm -hmm. Farmer. You're gonna find the same trays that we use. 
and True Leaf Market is going to have your seeds, and they're also going to have your hydroponic medium, which is what I would recommend. It's about a dollar um, per tray, and you just saturate that, and you can you can find that um, on there. And that's what I would recommend. And True Leaf Market, their basic salad blend. If you were only going to do one, I would say that that would be the one. You've got five brassicas in there. You've got uh, red acre cabbage, arugula, bok choy, broccoli, broccoli and purple kohlrabi, all in one tray. In one. So this yes. is the one tray that I would recommend growing if you were just going to grow one or two a week for yourself. And that's how I would do it. I wouldn't mess with soil. I would just do it hydroponically. Those lights are 30 bucks or something each. You get two two-footers. So a two-footer is going to cover your two trays. Um, across and you're going to find a way to fix them up under a shelf or something um, like that and then um, yeah that's it plant them you'd stack the two of them on top of each other then what you also you how, what are you talking about stacking them so stacking them is how we germinate so yeah you you basically plant them seed them and then you stack them on top of each other it simulates that soil um, on top of the seed and helps them to germinate, shoots their roots down and the plants up. Um, so they stack on top of each other like so. Then after four days, you'll see them sticking out the sides a little bit. You take them out under the light, six days, water them every single day. Got them and eat them. And you water them spritzing or? We bottom water them, which you can also do hydroponically. So we have two trays. This one has holes, this one does not. Um, and so the medium is here, we lift it up, water underneath, and they'll soak it up. Just like with a watering can, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So is it possible with good daylight to start a tray without two plants? Yes, absolutely. So I talked about that a little earlier, it's just going to take longer. Um, We're seed to harvest in 10 days, you're going to be two and a half weeks, probably. And and what would the stage in the time be between your two trays as opposed to two and a half weeks? Uh, that, that's, that's up to you based on when, um, how often you want to be harvesting. So it's four days germination and then t at least two weeks to be harvested after that. So, so you'd have some spacing in there. So at two weeks you would plant again. Yeah. Two, two weeks. Right, four days before you're going to harvest, you plant again. And harvesting, um, A, is it, is it possible to eat too many as you are? Or is it possible? Uh, I don't think so. I've gotten pretty carried away a couple of times. <laughs> We've gotten, um, you know, we have a little extra supply or something. I've eaten two pounds in one bowl. So that is the equivalent of four of these. Wow. All in one sitting, and it was like the first time in my life that someone asked me if I wanted microgreens. I was like, no. Okay. <laughs> it was a little scary, but then that went away. And next day, and I was ready to do it again. So, we eat a significant amount of them. Um, our subscription is three of these containers um, a week, and my wife and I eat roughly three containers on every meal. I have a dressing recipe I'll give to you. It's light because the leaves are so delicate. Yeah. If you try to put a thicker dressing on, you know, I mean, the, the shoots could hold up to it, but it's really nice and, I mean, we just eat tons of it. And your digestive system will react in a positive way right away. It's not going to cause you any kind of distress or anything like that because the microgreens go in and they repair your, your inner gut lining. Um, so it really improves your di di digestive tract. Yeah, a lot of fiber. Yeah, it's wonderful. Your body will... Some people talk about how they eat them for the first time and they just feel really good pretty soon after. Yeah. Because uh, the body di digests them quickly. We think that's some of the... I mean, we, we hit it from all different angles as far as our markets go. And, you know, the chefs obviously visually the, the, um, the flavors and stuff. But then you have people that love vegetables. Again, the nutrient density and flavor of that, they absolutely love it. But then let's say you don't like vegetables that much. Well, do you want to eat this much broccoli? Or, you know, I think they're, they're much less intimidating. So the kids are eating a lot of them. Because they're so small and they're so tender, 
And again, you know, this amount of broccoli is the equivalent to a pound and a half of raw broccoli. So you're trying to get a kid to eat two or three pieces. They could literally eat one bite of this and that would be the equivalent. So you could mix the sunflower shoots into macaroni and cheese. Yes. Actually, that, so. <laughs> it's also Pretty really good. helpful for people who are going chemo, undergoing chemotherapy and cancer treatments because they lose their appetite and Mayo Clinic recommends that they eat some sulfurophane, which broccoli Raw broccoli really is the only thing that has that, and you have to chew it and eat it raw. You can't cook it, and nobody has the appetite for that if you put a big piece of raw broccoli in front of somebody. It's hard for them to eat that, especially with their suppressed uh, immune system and their appetite. So it's easier for them to eat a forkful, and it's really flavorful, and then they get all of that nutrition from the microgreen rather than having to eat the adult plant. So this salad one has broccoli in it, but you know, I'm a little biased on all the different ones, but basically I've read a lot of different stuff and they've gone as far as to say like the single greatest thing that you can eat is broccoli microgreens. So yeah. cancer patients going through that, you know, the number one thing, you know, broccoli sprouts or microgreens for them. I mean, microgreens haven't been around for that long. It was sprouts and they were at, they're actually married. That's why we talk a lot about the difference in sprouts and microgreens. We have many clients still call what we have sprouts, you know, and I've had to let that go. But <laughs> so, you know, bro broccoli microgreens, I mean, they're like, that is just what you should be eating. Yeah. So um, that was a little bit much for me, but that, that they were, that article was very adamant about it. If you could pick one thing to eat, that's what you should eat. So we put a fair amount of broccoli out there. Yeah, it's one of our more popular varieties. Yep. Because people know about it. If you know about a, 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 a microgreen or a sprout and you're really health conscious, attacking it from that health conscious aspect, broccoli is what people tend to look for. So. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Um, uh, are there any like um, improvisational uh, containers that you can use? Um, like, let's say you just like, if you're not doing it seriously, but just wanted a tray or something and like you just have something laying around the house. And, I like to reuse some things every now and then. Yeah. It's probably not. Is, is it is it applicable or probably to to reuse a different tray besides a microgreen tray? Yeah, yeah. So like it's to, to use like to improvise something. You um, could. I sure, mean, absolutely. You could. I mean, it's just. I mean, I'd say a regular growing tray um, that you have. You just have to have drainage. Yeah, so, drainage. Yeah. Is, yeah, drainage is pretty much it. But what you're talking about, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you had a piece of wood, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're on it like that, I'm not, but a you planter? can, um, yeah, you, you can shell do that. Shell makes me think, um, the baking tray. Oh, yeah. I use has a, I guess you could have that extra yeah. baking tray. You could do the baking tray. The issue is you're not going to have any drainage in that. Yeah, you got right. So you're going to, you would be drilling holes into it. These are four bucks a piece, so, oh, well, okay. you know, I, I would recommend doing that. You can get the... The cheaper ones, even you can get them for like a dollar, and just be careful with them and don't break them. I said yeah. earlier, um, and the fee that the reason that we spend a little bit more and use these trays is because of how hardy they are, so we don't have to worry about them breaking. But if you're if you get the the inexpensive ones, if they're like fifty cents a tray, and you're growing one or two trays and just being careful, you're not going to break it. But we're we're scrubbing them and washing them and moving them and stacking them and everything, so that we break those. Does Earthwood have them? Uh, I mean, if I wanted to take 30 bucks back to go to Earthwood, get some. I don't think so. I don't think they have microgreen trees. They're pretty heavily into, yeah, soil and, and all of that um, stuff, but I'm not sure that they have microgreen. seeds, yeah, seeds or um, trays. The regular, like, I mean, those, those plant trays that, like, you know, have pea trees or something locally. Um, the little, they're, they're, a lot of them are done in five by fives, and those are those are grown too and can be done for personal, right? So we have some of those that we do for wheatgrass, and so you just have the bottom tray, and then you have eight five by fives, and like so that's you know that's doable as well. Easier baking tray sheet for the bottom tray, and then just improvise something to go on top. Yeah. Of that. Sure, playing along. Those just tend to be thicker though as well. So 
you know, again, we're, you know, you can try it. Um, it's just, again, thicker. So ours are, these are only an inch, right? So the soil's there and the water's on the bottom. It soaks it up very quickly. If you have a baking tray that's very shallow, then you have a four inch tray that's sitting on top of that. You go to bottom water it, you know, those roots might not be out to the bottom yet and they might have a hard time soaking up, getting that um, soaked up there. So is this green tray touching the bottom of the ground? Yeah, it's resting in there. Yeah, it's, re it's resting in there, I mean, to me it's a relatively small investment if you want to do it at your house, and I would recommend getting the proper growing mediums. You know, they're, they're relatively simple to grow, however, you don't have a lot of room for mistakes because it's, again, seed to harvest in 10 days. You're growing the, something in the garden, right, and it gets a little bit dry. Okay, well, I can water it. I've got two weeks. I've got three months before I'm harvesting it, so I can rebound from that. You go four days into germination and they dry out completely flop down at day five or six, it's three days before you're harvesting them. That, that could be the end of that grow. Um, so having them kind of in those optimal, optimal trays. I, where it all started for me was an, an ad on Instagram and I bought everything I needed for a hundred bucks. No lights. And I did grow them in the windowsill, but it took significantly longer. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't even watch a YouTube video. I just, the pamphlet that it came with, I was like, okay. I didn't understand seed density. That was the other thing that we didn't talk about. I would just say rule of thumb, roughly 25 grams for the brassicas is your dry seed weight. For um, yeah, for a 1020 tray. A 1020 plat is, they're, they're, they do vary and everybody has different opinions. That's something you can look up online. Um, you know, we, we plant anywhere from 22 to 28 grams, depending on the variety in the brassicas. Most of them are 25. Broccoli's 25, the salad's 25, purple karate's 25, or cabbage is 23. But again, those are nuances that we have dialed in to exactly what we want. You, we like them at 22 grams. You plant it at 25 for yourself at your house, you're not gonna notice that. You're and gonna you just it. spread them out by hand? We measure them into a little small cup and then and then we shake them across. So you, um, you, you're shaking, you, you developed <laughs> the right yeah. shaking pattern. It's a technique for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I got, like I said, that grow pack for me, I think was $100 and it came with the, the um, biodegradable um, growing substrate. It came with 10 trays and they were the like 50 cent trays. Like those are the super cheap plastic ones, which again, if you don't beat them up, you can survive those. Um, came with like a little misting bottle and a few different packages of seeds. Again, no, um, no shoots and no uh, radish because those, those really need to be grown in soil. They have to have weight. It's just kind of another thing. So just for a home grow, I'd go with brassicas and you can find those starter kits. Um, True Leaf, again, Mark, I, I really like them. They're a relatively, again, smaller company. They're U.S. based. Everything's done in the United States. They have both options for organic and non-organic. They're my backup plan. I, I do actually a fair amount of business with them. If, they, if, if my big commercial seed company doesn't have what I need, um, then I go to them and I get it. Some smaller, different varieties. If the price is right, again, like a mustard, I get it from them. Uh, the substrate they have, much smaller packages, really high quality seed, great germination rate. So that's that's where I would send a, um, anybody that you know. True leaf, true leaf, yeah. And and probably, you know, like I would look at their grow kits. Um, they probably have some inexpensive trays. And uh, instead of, you know, trying to piece everything together, kind of the way that I said, I think you could you know, maybe a hundred bucks, maybe less, um, depending on the size. You could just have everything you needed. You know, we're gonna send you the substrate, the trays, the medium, the whole thing. We'll even send you a whole flyer. So it's like, this is. So how often do you change the substrate? Is that every time? Yeah. The roots will grow into that and and just take it over, and then you can throw it into a compost pile. Um, and you've got to start. You've got to start fresh every single time. That's what we do as well too. We dump all the soil into our compost and we start over. 
Did you ever try mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, what exactly is a substrate, and you, you can't grow without it, or it won't, or it won't, or probably won't do it efficiently. Or yeah, like the substrate is just it's just the medium that it's in, right? So substrate is soil, or right. these organic ones that are like biodegradable mats that are like mm. they're hard and crispy at first, yeah. and then you water them, and they and they kind of plump up, and they they have. Um, water retention, again, that's a lot of the microbean mm -hmm. soils and different stuff, just the right amount of drainage, but also retention as well, mm -hmm. so. We use ProMix MP, uh -huh. it has mycorrhizae in it. Oh, okay. um, I brought a sample, you can look at it, and we get it by the pallet load. Uh, yeah. So if you do hydroponically, don't you have the substrate? Mm -hmm. I guess the mat would be considered the substrate. Yeah, that, that's it's just kind of like a thin mat, and True Leaf has those. And it's like, it almost is like paper or those dish rags that you use every mm -hmm. use and get them wet, and they kind of clump up a little bit. Yeah. So they don't involve to be doing really kind of time. Yeah, you would just lay that down. That's what I would recommend for you. We, you know, have our soil cost down based on how much we, we plant, but, um, those are a dollar a, a tray, so, you know, Those you the substrates are a dollar, they cost about a dollar a tray. Um, so you really, for a home grow, you know, you're, you're in for two bucks a tray. Again, getting close to a half pound. You know, we sell, you know, obviously for more than that, and ours is pretty aggressive, but again, you're growing it for yourself, that's, have almost a half pound of micro, maybe, maybe a little bit less for that amount, you know, in 10 days for two dollars. So it looks like you could keep from um, one end of the tray to the next. I mean, I'm mean, not going to sit down and eat two pounds of one. <laughs> what? I like your desk. This tray is going to yield you roughly a half pound. So if I could pull out. You would want to cut okay. with a nice, a sharp knife so that you don't pull, because if you pull, the microbe, you'll pull the soil out. You might like scissors too, scissors. I'll yeah. give you examples so you guys can. Might be easier. I've seen people doing that. I've even seen commercial growers doing that. A lot less risk that you're gonna cut your fingers. So, you know, they have gardening scissors and stuff like that. You grab it and you just cut it. And mm -hmm. Again, one or two trays. We didn't have that as a couple. Really good to grab it. From a commercial stand, from a commercial standpoint, um, I, I understand as you get larger and larger, your percentage of uh, income grows because you're buying larger bulk. But as a start, what could you expect, percentage-wise, of output of money to? Twenty-five percent uh, materials plus your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because as you grow, you have to buy more. Shelving and lights and soil and seed and right. It's going to be the same it's for for a small commercial grower and what I was describing to her. You're going to be two dollars to two dollars and fifty cents a tray, depending on how you're doing it. You know, again, the the soil, um, depending on what type of soil you're using, and um, or or a substrate. Um, yeah. So and then you're. And then you're getting about five containers out of one of those trays. Yeah, we're trying to get in the neighborhood of fifteen dollars a tray, fifteen to yeah. eighteen dollars across all our fields, uh -huh. though. So it's, again, it depends on that. We're spanned across everything. Not a lot of growers do that. They focus on farmers markets, only restaurants, only grocery stores. We do it all. Like we do. We deliver it directly to customers' houses. Um, on a subscription model, we sell it to multiple grocery stores um, and, and the restaurants as well. So The only thing we don't do is farmer's market. It would be lovely if we could, but we just, it does require a lot of time. Um, you can't just leave. You have to be around all the time. And there's something to be done every day on the farm. So it's hard for us to get away on a weekend and go spend a weekend at the farmer's market. <laughs> it's, it's pretty labor intensive, but not too bad. Yep. And 
do you have an apprentice program at your at your own personal? We don't yet, but we're you know as we continue to, to scale and grow, we're definitely potentially looking for for people that are interested in, in working and learning yeah. and learning the business for sure. So do you know that just due to doing all the harvesting and growing and For that and having students that are in ag um, in the state of New Mexico that are interested, we would love to, to have them come and, and help us out work on the farm. Mm -hmm. Yep, so oh, definitely. We we've got um, we have a, we have our a very five thousand square foot um, outdoor garden and we're working on potentially expanding that as well. And none of that is monetized and none of that is commercial. So that's a whole other world. So we're you know potentially interested in yeah an ag student or somebody that has the idea already knows about farming and how to commercialize um, an outdoor farm and basically help and teach and partner with me on that and then I'll show them micro things and we'll put them together. Obviously our customer base um, you know outdoor vegetables all those different things are, are there. So. And utilizing an amazing facility like the TCEBC with a big commercial kitchen to be able to commercialize a product and put a label on it and get it out to the market. So yeah. it's, it's a wonderful Pickle resource. Piece. Yes, <laughs> we would love to, to utilize the facility basil in that pesto. way. Basil pesto, micro basil pesto. Yeah. Yes, that sounds yeah. good. Yeah. It sounds like there's no real trick or hard thing to starting a trade or two at home. Just water, watering. Yeah. And tap water, mm -hmm. fine. Yep. Mm -hmm. Pretty much if you can drink it, they're okay. Again, earlier and I said that the microgreens are very similar to humans. So if you can drink the tap water, you're good. They like humidity similar to humans and they like temperature similar to humans. So 68 to 72 is where most of us are comfortable. Um, you know, and 30 to 40% humidity is where we're comfortable. I think if you were going to grow them in the sun like that, you just want to be careful that they don't get too dried out. And the house plants that get colder, like down um, to 62 at night. Yeah, they don't like the cold so much. They, 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 it's all just going to affect your timing. So again, they're like a regular plant, like it, it, and our summer nights go down, it's just going to lengthen your grow. So as soon as it drops into 62 degrees, they're not really growing, they're just kind of hanging out. So they're not going to be growing as much um, during that time. So it's just going to take you longer, and it's something that you know you you'll have to figure out as far as spacing out your germination and stuff. Um, also, one thing I never touched on uh, was lighting. We run most of ours on an eighteen six, so the lights are on eighteen hours, and they're dark six hours. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're growing at 12, 12 or whatever as, as regular daylight, you're nowhere getting nowhere near that amount of light that we're getting. So again, optimize a lot of light, all of that for us to turn the farm over as quickly as we do. Um, but just growing for yourself, it's just something that you'll have to figure out. And I think number one, you're going to want to grow more than one tray at a time. You'll grow two or three trays. You know, you'll have a you know 10 a day, two week life cycle somewhere in there, and then you'll be planting again, and you'll just be kind of moving it, <coughs> moving it along. And then if you run out, you can go with SIDS and buy some. <laughs> <laughs> so from a lay person's point of view, they would sleep at night, but grow during the day? Correct. With mm -hmm. their 12 hours for Yep. Mm -hmm. And we do the opposite just because it's... Yeah. Uh, because it, uh, we do it because of temperature. So again, you know, in the summer, it's cooler at night, so all the lights crank on, and it's a little bit cold. light cycle for us tends to be at night and they dark out um, early in the morning until about the time that I go out to water. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank this you. was very informative. Yeah. Um, well, for
for those of you that are here in person, and I will make sure to send you online the forms. If you could just fill out this form for us. It helps us at TCBC to, we're working under a grant to provide these workshops for you. So if you could fill this out and get it to me, and I'll give you a stipend for your gas. Um, nice. And then I have some other information. You know, we're working with people if you're interested in starting to grow, um, there's a lot of programs. There's a hoop house that's available through the through some grants, and so we're here to help growers. We'd like Taos to be a growing community. So um, talk to me afterwards. So and thank you guys again. I can't recommend these enough. You guys are amazing. Great. Right. So nice. All right. Yummy.